we complain we're only stealing from God this morning. Uh, like to open up in prayer first thing this morning. Wonder if anyone's got any special objects. Remember that. Remember that. kids as they go back to school. Let's remember our pastor this morning. Always lift him up in prayer. Uh, our Sunday school teachers, choir, musicians. Uh, let's remember the lost. Always have a burden for the lost. You know, we should desire to see lost souls saved. We can't can't say that enough. We can't, we can't lose that burden. Uh, if no one else has anything. Anyone like to and will? Let's come around the altar this morning.
This morning I'm going to be in Colossians chapter number one. Colossians one. Colossians 1, verse 1 says, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, and Timotheus were brother to the saints and faithful brethren in Christ which are at Colossians. Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We give thanks to God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, <coughs> praying always for you. Since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love which we have to all the saints, for the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, whereof ye heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel, which is come unto you as it is in all the world, and bringeth forth fruit as, as it doth also in you, since the day ye heard of it and knew the grace of God in truth. As ye also learned of Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who is for you a faithful minister of Christ, who also declared unto us your love in the Spirit. For this cause we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you, and do desire that ye might be filled with the knowledge of his will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding that ye might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God Amen. strengthened with all might according to his glorious power unto all patience and long suffering with joyfulness I want to ask you this morning are you walking worthy of the Lord? Are you living worthy of the Lord? Does the way you live your life please God? You know, that's questions that as Christians, we should ask ourselves every day. Am I living my life in a way that would be pleasing to God? Am I living my life the way God would have me to live it? Christians, that should be something we look at and ask ourselves every single day. Because that's what we should be striving to do is Amen. living for God. Living our life in a way that would make us be pleasing to God. Amen. You know, you might say, well, what is a worthy life for God? Well, are you living a fruitful life? Do you have close relationship with God? Are you talking to God on a daily basis? Are you spending time with him daily? Yes. You know, we have to be fruitful in our life. We have to be productive in our Christian walk. We have to be looking for what God has for us to do, what we can be doing for God. You know, but that don't mean that we should go out and do things so that other people see us doing that for God. That's not what that means. We shouldn't be trying to do something for God so we can get recognition from the people around us. To me, that's not truly serving God. That would be serving man. That would be serving your pride. And that's not what living... A pleasing life to God is. You should be doing the things that no one will ever see or know about. You know, doing the things that only you and God are going to know about. Amen. That's what matters. God is what matters. Not what man thinks, not what man sees, but what God sees and thinks. That's what matters in our life. Amen. You know, 
Do the things in your life that God's showing you you need to do, that God's telling you you should be doing. You know, God is not looking for a prideful, spotlight worker. It's not what God's looking for. He's looking for a humble servant. There's a big difference in the two of those. There's a big difference in the two of those. And that humble servant is what we need to be. You know, a humble servant don't need the recognition from the people around them. They don't need the pat on the back and someone telling them, that was a good thing you done right there. A humble servant don't need that. God sees what a humble servant does and that's all they need is to know that they've done what God had for them to do. You know, and we also, we need to be continually increasing our knowledge in God. You know, how, how do you increase your knowledge of God? How do you do that? Kevin tells us about every time he's up here. You pray, you read your Bible, you come to church. You serve God. It's simple. You know, but yet we live such a fast-paced life that we don't take the time to talk to God. We don't take the time to read our Bible. We don't take time to do the simple things that God would have us to do. You know, we should look to God in all things in our life. You know, when we see God move, we should recognize that that's God moving. If we're close to God, if we have that knowledge and understanding of God, we're going to recognize a move of God. We're not going to say, well, that was luck, or that was a coincidence. We're going to say, that was God that just moved. It's so, so often we play it up to luck or coincidence. We take away God's glory and what he has blessed us with and what he's done for us. We can't do that. We have to recognize God. Amen. And when we grow our knowledge of God, we're going to get to know him better. We're going to feel his power more. Our spiritual strength is going to grow stronger and stronger you know and that's what we should want is we should want that spiritual strength to grow we should want to feel God's power in our life more we should want to know God more you know increasing our knowledge in God we're going to become more thankful of God we're going to recognize the power, the blessings. We're going to recognize all that more. And when we recognize that, that allows us to become more thankful. Because if we don't recognize it, how are we going to be thankful for it? You know, and we, and we can learn to be thankful in the bad times as well as in the good times. Because when something seems bad to us, what we have to do is understand that God has a purpose. He has a reason. He's working. He's making us stronger. He's using us to help someone around us. We don't go through hard times for nothing. We grow in those times. We grow closer to God in those times. We grow spiritually in our strength and our faith in those times we should be thankful for the hard times that we have to face we should be thankful that God gives us that opportunity to grow closer to him you know and we have to separate ourselves from the world in order to live that pleasing life for the Lord are you willing to do that are you willing to cut that sin from your life 
Are you willing to cut the worldly ties that you have in your life in order to be able to grow closer to God? It won't be easy. It's not easy to cut those ties. It's not easy to cut those things out of your life. But what you have to remember is that you don't have to do it alone. That God's right there with you. He's right there to help you, to give you the strength to be able to do that. wonder if anyone might have a word for the Lord this morning. times we'll pray a prayer asking for that protection but when we get it we forget to thank God for answering that prayer Anybody else has anything? We'll dismiss our classes. Good morning. How is everybody? Eric, you break one. Lord, we bless your name this morning. Thank you for the word, Lord, that you let James give us. Thank you for praying out for Ted. Thank you that he would have something, Lord, that from you that would help us this morning. Thank you that the rest of the service in your hands. Do the things we do. Things only you can do. Supernatural things, Lord, not the people. Help us today, Lord. We all need it so bad. In Jesus' name. Amen.
Raise your hand if you've ever had anybody intentionally do you wrong. That hurts, don't it? Raise your hand if that person, you've accidentally bumped into them somewhere. Well, that's awkward, ain't it? Somebody tell me. Give me an example of, of what happened when, when this happened in your life. What's the feelings you felt toward this person when you bumped into them? I'll, I'll get started. I had a fella do me wrong one time. He intentionally done it. He lied to do it. He knew he was doing it when he done it. And for a long time, I, I hated this fella. And I just by chance bumped into him one day, and the way that I felt toward him made me feel bad about myself. I, I really don't have the words to explain the way that I, that I felt toward him. And a lot of years has passed since all this has happened, and, and he's, he got sick and died a few years ago. And after the initial sting of what happened kind of wore off and, and he did die, I've always regretted that I didn't make an effort to go to him and say, whatever happened between us in the past, I, I want to forget about it. I don't want to feel the way that I feel toward you. I, I have always regretted that. He, he intentionally done something to me that hurt me, that hurt my family too. And, but at the same time, what happened really wasn't worth the way that I had to feel toward him. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? I don't like feeling that way. When you see this person, it makes you feel awkward. It brings up hateful feelings that you've got toward them. Maybe you thought they were gone. Maybe you knew they weren't gone. But it happens. We, we have to live with other people. They're going to do us wrong sometimes. We have to learn to deal with these things. Now, raise your hand if you've ever been a member of or attended a church and somebody there done you wrong. Raise your hand if you've ever went, attended or been to a church and the church done you wrong. Now, in a way, on a, on a personal level, when the person does you wrong, it hurts. But when it is a church member, somebody that you love and that you consider to be your church family and, uh, you know, you build relationships with and they do something like this to you, it makes it a hundred times worse. Somebody tell me why. I hate to say it, I couldn't hear what you said. You have faith in them and trust them. And That's exactly right. Faith. That's exactly right. You you want to put confidence in this person. But somehow, they they see fit to, to do you wrong. And when it's the whole church that kind of rises up against you, it makes it even that much worse. So, the hard question is this. When we see these people, when we... Like I said, bump into them. How are we supposed to treat them? Boy, that's easy to do, ain't it? That's what you want to do, ain't it? Uh, we, we want to do that, but a lot of the time what we do is we say, I forgive you, and then we cut them out of our life forever. Or sometimes we'll say, I don't forgive you, and I'm cutting you out of my life forever. Right? Sometimes, and often, it's even family that we have to deal with this. And... You know, uh, sometimes it's a spouse. That's that's an abusive spouse. We 
this person has mistreated us. We have to put our feelings toward this person under the microscope in our life. We have to look at how we feel toward this person and why and what we're supposed to do toward them. Now, it's not right for us to live in an abusive relationship. It's dangerous. But what often we do, we just we get bitterness built up in our heart for this person and we have to live with them in the same house forever. And that's a miserable life. We don't want to live that way. I, I don't want to feel this way toward the people that I love. But sometimes it happens in, in relationships. Now this is awkward for me to have to stand up here and talk about, but it happens in our lives. You're going to think, as I talk about this, about somebody that has done something to you that made you hate them. That put hate in your heart toward them, and that is wrong of you. They done something wrong, but the fact that you hate them is wrong of you. It's easy to do and, and hard to get rid of. Now somebody tell me what the Bible says we're supposed to do toward these people. And stay away from them forever? Turn over to Luke chapter number 6. While you're turning there, I'm going to tell you, a friend of mine went through a divorce a few years ago, and he said, after it was all said and done, he said, I realized that we hated each other and lived in the same house. And he said, that sucks the, life, the fun out of life when you hate the person that you live with. And he's, he's not a, a faithful man. He, he, he just uh, kind of took it the way it was. And, and it, I've always remembered how he said that. He said, it sucks the fun out of life because I hated my wife. And, and he, he still don't have nothing nice to say about her. And, and she did do something to him that, that she shouldn't have done. But at the same time, it worries me because he feels this way toward her. Luke chapter number 6, we're going to start at verse 27. It says, But I say unto you which hear, Love your enemies, do good to them which hate you, bless them that curse you, pray for them that despitefully use you, and unto him that smiteth thee on one cheek, offer also the other. And him that taketh away thy cloak, Forbid not to take thy coat also. Give to every man that asketh of thee, and of him that taketh away thy goods, ask them not again. And as ye would that men should do to you, do ye also to them likewise. For if ye love them which love you, what thank have ye? For sinners also love those that love them. And if you do good to them that which to them which do good to you, what thank have you? For sinners also, even the same, do even the same. And if you lend to them of whom you hope to receive, what thank have you? For sinners also lend to sinners and receive as much again. But love your enemies and do good to them. And do good and lend hoping for nothing again. And your reward shall be great. And ye shall be the children of the highest, for he is kind to the unthankful and to the evil. Be ye therefore merciful, as your Father also is merciful. Judge not, and ye shall not be judged. Condemn not, and ye shall not be condemned. Forgive, and ye shall be forgiven. Give, and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. Shall men give unto your bosom for with the same measure that you meet with all, it shall be measured unto you again. So we have here a list of ten things, starting at verse 27. I'm just going to read them off to you. Love, do good, bless, give, lend, be merciful, judge not, and condemn not, and then forgive. That the word here says that we're supposed to do to those who treat us 
wrong one. And not one of them is a negative thing that you do toward them in any way. So imagine that you're walking out of a gas station and you look up and this person who done you wrong is there and you look at them. The, the awkwardness between you all of a sudden pops up. You're standard, staring each other in the face. You're looking at them. They're looking at you nervously. And what are they expecting? They, they've done something to you. They know they've done it. What are they expecting you to do to them? Go ahead and say it. Somebody say it. You know where it is. They're expecting you to cuss them out, right? <laughs> yeah. They, <know. laughs> yeah. They, they know that they have hurt you in some way, and they are expecting a negative response from you because of that. Because that's what the world gives, right? If somebody walks up and slaps somebody in the world, the world wants to slap the person back. And we, do, we want to, too. But that's not what the Word says to do, is it? They are expecting you to treat them negatively because they've done you wrong. That's right. You agree with that, right? Everybody's being quiet today for some reason. I don't know why. Huh? <laughs> you think it's tough from that side. You're going to say it louder. That, that's exactly right. Okay, but in this case, they done you wrong. And you have accidentally bumped into them, and it's, the awkwardness is there. Point number one, when somebody has done you wrong, they already know they've done it. You don't have to call them up every day and tell them. You don't have to remind them. You don't have to go around behind their back and say, guess what he done to me. Well, there's a problem right there. Well, a bad problem. Yeah, but but we're talking about how we feel toward them, not how they feel toward us. So my number back with a car and it's not an acceptable <laughs> Although that's what you want to do. <laughs> that's not acceptable. That's exactly right. It's definitely easier because if you've done it wrong, you can take care of it. And, and like Susan said, they might not even think it's wrong. So a lot of times that's just going to lead to more or a greater dispute. Yeah, I mean, how weird is it going to make it if you walk up to somebody and say, I forgive you for what you've done, and they say, I didn't do nothing wrong. I don't know what you're talking about. You know, I mean, we're, we're talking about a problem in your heart. The, the fact that, that you feel this way toward them, whether they care if they've done it or not. They might have done done you wrong knowing they've done it. They might have done you wrong not thinking that they've done anything wrong. And they might have done you wrong not caring how you feel about it. Yeah. I've, I've posted something. I've forgiven the worst of somebody else and felt nothing. My thoughts on the second one is to ask to forgive for yourself. That, that's exactly right. James Watson said something in here one time. He said unforgiveness is like drinking poison and expecting it to kill the other person. And that's a perfect description of what unforgiveness is. It's, it's you that it's going to destroy. It's not them. That's exactly right. Especially if they think they didn't do anything wrong. They're not worried about it.
But some people do worry about it. Some people do you wrong and then they, they think about it later and, and realize that they did. What well, gets me is if, if you do me wrong, it's no big deal. I'm pretty quick to forgive and forget. But if you do something that hurts somebody I care about, that's like a whole other level of, you know. That's exactly right. That is exactly right, Philip. So point number one was when somebody has done you wrong, most of the time anyway, they already know that they done it. I mean, they might even tell themselves that they didn't do anything wrong, but somehow, you know, it's going to come out. And you don't have to do anything to remind them. You don't have to give them the evil eye every time you see them. You don't have to, to go behind their back and tell everybody what they've done. It's going, to, it's going to come out one way or the other. They didn't accidentally do it. They know they didn't accidentally do it, and they know that they did it. They did it on purpose. Sometimes they might even regret it. Now think about this. This person has done you wrong, and they're sitting at their house right now thinking, I done Alan wrong all them years ago, but it's going to be so awkward if I walk up to him and, and say, I'm sorry, Alan, for what I've done. I mean, he hates me, and there's nothing I can do about it. If you don't show these traits, these, this list of ten things that I just read off to you toward this person, they don't. the door's not open for them to come ask forgiveness. That's right. They're, you become unapproachable because you because you keep bringing it up, keep reminding them, and and this keeps happening. So either way, whether they know it, whether they don't know it, whatever, if you close the door to them, there's no way to rebuild this bridge unless you go to them. Right? Turn over to Genesis chapter number 50. And we're going to look at this. And we're going to be flipping back and forth, so, so keep this place here. Genesis chapter 50, we're going to start at verse number 15. Okay, Genesis 50, 15. And when Joseph's brethren saw that their father was dead, they said unto Joseph, they said, Joseph will pre-adventure hate us and will certainly require us of all the evil that we did unto him. And they sent a messenger unto Joseph, saying, Thy father did command before he died, saying, So shall you say unto Joseph, Forgive, I pray thee now, the trespasses of thy brethren and their sin, for they did unto thee evil. And now we pray thee, Forgive the trespasses of the servants of the God of the Father of and Joseph wept. And we, okay, they sent the messenger. And when they said that to Joseph, and Joseph wept and spake unto him, and his brethren also went and fell down before his face. And they said, Behold, we be thy servants. And Joseph said unto them, Fear not, for I am in the place of God. But as for you, though evil... I'm sorry, y'all. Can't even read this morning. But as for you, ye thought evil against me, but God meant it unto good, meant it unto good, and bring to pass it as it is this day to save much people alive. Therefore, fear ye not, I will nurse you and your little ones. And he comforted them and spake kindly unto them. Now, look at who it is. Joseph's brethren, verse 15. They realized their father had died, and they were afraid that the only thing keeping Joseph from seeking revenge against them was the fact that he loved their father so much that he wouldn't do it while he was still alive. So now they're afraid that he's going to retaliate against them because of what they'd done all them years ago. Now, does that sound to you like they forgot it? They did not forget it. They knew they had done wrong. They were afraid because they had done wrong, and they sent this messenger to Joseph saying, we done you wrong. Now, they didn't come do it. They're All right. 
They knew they'd done it. That was point number one. Now think about Joseph. All these years, he's he's went through all these things that God uh, that God allowed to happen to him because of the wrong that they done. He ended up in a pit. He ended up in prison, but he ended up in the palace where God wanted him. And then all of a sudden, his brothers are standing before him, and he has power over. Now, somebody tell me what caused all of this to take place. What got the ball rolling that caused all this in Joseph's life? Jealousy. Jealous of what? Of his father's love. His father loved him more. Okay. Turn back to Genesis chapter 37. But hold your finger right there. Genesis 37, and we're going to start at verse number 5 to start with here. It says, And Joseph dreamed a dream, and he told his brethren, and they hated him yet the more. And he said unto them, Here I pray thee this dream which I have dreamed. For behold, we are binding sheaves in the field, and lo, my sheep arose and also stood upright. And behold, your sheep stood around about it and made absence to my sheep. And his brethren said unto him, Shalt thou indeed reign over us, or shalt thou indeed have dominion over us? And they hated him yet the more for his dreams and for his words. And he dreamed yet another dream, and told his brethren, and said, Behold, I have dreamed a dream more, and behold, the sun and the moon and eleven stars made absence to me. And he told it to his father and his brethren, and his father rebuked him. And said unto him, What is this dream that thou hast dreamed? Shall I and thy mother and thy brethren indeed come, bow down ourselves unto thee, to the earth? And his brethren envied him. But his father observed the same. And his brethren went to feed the, their flock in Shechem. All right, now skip down here. Jacob sends Joseph to check on his brothers. And all of a sudden... When he shows up, look at verse number 19. And they said one to another, Behold, this dreamer cometh. Come now, therefore, and let us slay him and cast him into some pit that we will say some evil beast has devoured him. And we shall see what will become of his dreams. Now that is premeditated, right? They plan to do this wrong thing to Joseph. And Reuben heard it, and he delivered him out of their hands, and said, Let us not kill him. And Reuben said unto them, Shed no blood, but cast him into this pit that is in the wilderness, and lay no hand upon him, that he might rid him of their hands, and deliver him to their father again. And it came to pass, when Joseph was come up to his brethren, that the, they stripped Joseph out of his coat of many colors, and they took him and cast him into the pit. And the pit was empty, and there was no water in it. And they sat down to eat bread, and lifted up their eyes, and looked. And behold, a company of Ishmaelites came from Gilead with their camels, bearing spicery and balm and myrrh, going to carry it down to Egypt. And Judah said unto his brethren, What profit is it that we slay our brother and conceal his blood? Come, let us sell him to the Ishmaelites, and let not our hands be upon him, for he is our brother and our flesh. And his brethren were content. Then there passed by the Midianites, the merchantmen, and they drew and lifted up Joseph out of the pit and, and sold Joseph to the Ishmaelites for 20 pieces of silver. And they brought Joseph to Egypt. Okay. The problem with it all to start with was Joseph's dream. Right? Who gave Joseph the dream? God gave Joseph the dream. Joseph is in the pit listening to his brothers sell him into slavery. Now put yourself in that place. You think somebody's done you wrong, but has your brother threw you in a pit and you get to stand there and listen 
to them up there negotiating to sell you to do hard slavish labor the rest of your life. His brothers done him wrong. They knew it, but they done him wrong because of what God gave Joseph. God gave Joseph the dreams. Point number two, sometimes people will knowingly do you wrong because of your anointing. Now that one hurts because think about it. God gave me this good thing. God wants me to use this good thing to help him. God wants me to use this thing that he gave me to help others. But this person has done me wrong because of what God gave me. Something don't seem right about that, does it? When they said, Behold, this dreamer cometh, they were exactly right. Joseph was a man of dreams. He had dreams. He interpreted dreams. And God gave him the ability. But it landed him at first in the pit, then in prison. Who, When the butler and the baker showed up, when he interpreted their dream and they got out, he said, Remember me when you're before Pharaoh. And they forgot him. He stayed in prison for years after that. But God had his hand on him the whole time. Now listen, when somebody does you wrong because of the anointing that's in your life, God still has his hand on you. When they do you wrong, God don't remove his hand. So do not forget that. So now flip back to chapter number 50. All right, now Joseph has a chance to get revenge. He, he could get revenge right here. His father won't be disappointed anymore if he does it, and he has the power and the authority to do it, and they know that he has the power and authority to do it. Now look at verse 19. I wondered about that. <laughs> because they all came, came just the way he said they was going to happen, didn't they? Verse number 19 here. And Joseph said unto them, Fear not, for I am in the place of God. He said, I am in the place of God, but what does that mean? I am not God. God's going to be your judge. God's going to be the person that done, done you wrong, judge. But it's not your place to seek revenge, just like it wasn't Joseph's place. I am not your judge. Verses 20 and 21. But as for you, you thought evil against me, but God meant it into good to bring past that it, as it is this day to save much people alive. Now therefore, fear not. I will nourish you and your little ones. And he comforted them and spake kindly unto them. Mm-hmm. Even though you meant to hurt me, even though you hated me, the word says that they hated him, even though you were jealous, you were envious of me, even though all these things that you've done unto me, I'm still going to be good to you. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. And he said, I'm going to do good to you, and I love this part right here, and your children. Yeah. Not only did Joseph... Forgive and bless them, but he introduced a generational blessing into these, the lives of these people that done him wrong. Yeah. Now, y'all think about this person. As we've been talking about this, you've got somebody in your mind. Yeah. How would you like to be the one to say, let it go, I want to bless you, I want good things for your children? Does that not make you feel good about yourself if you can think that towards somebody that at one time you hated? Now turn back to Luke. Kevin, I guess the saving grace of this story to me would be that you know they said when when their brother the brothers saw how much Jacob loved him, they couldn't even stand to look at Jacob or talk to him. He didn't get to judge him then, he didn't get to judge him when he was in the pit. He didn't get to judge him while he was in the prison. But he got to judge him when he come out of the all the bondage that he was in. And it was a long time. God 
didn't make him. While it was happening, God didn't force him to forgive them at that moment. God didn't force him to try to go through them. God showed him grace to come out of it. And, and that makes me feel a little bit better this morning. Because you can't walk up to somebody in the middle of something and say, I forgive you. Why it's happening. Well, well, after that fellow I was talking about, two days after he done what he done to me, what I wanted to give him was a good hard punch in the face. That's right. That's exactly right. And that is, at the time, that's what I thought he deserved, and I wished bad things on that man. Yeah. But as time passed by, and then and then he got sick and died. Now, I never have the chance again to, to go to this fellow and say, just forget it. it it's not worth it. Right. And it's not worth it. It's, it's too late for me to do that now. But there are people on this earth walking that have done people in here wrong. And it's not too late That's right. to go to these people and say, it's time for us to let this go. I, I, I don't care what happens. Even if you <laughs> have to sacrifice your pride to do it. Amen. That's, right. That's what you got to do sometimes. Sure. It may have taken Joseph that long to get mentally ready to forgive him. Yeah. But if God knew his thoughts the whole time, he could have been harboring hate how many years that was. He had to have that conversation in his head. The one that everybody in here's had when they're going down the road of what they're going to say to somebody or what they'd like to say. Everybody's had that. To the person that's on their mind right now. Everybody's went through that scenario of what they want to say, what they're going to say. Maybe even write it down and say, don't leave nothing out. Yeah. I'm glad you're saying that for the whole time I've been up here talking. I thought I was the only one that this has ever happened to, but. <laughs> no, it's, it's everybody in here. That's why these messages, this is real, dealing with real issues. Okay, turn back over to uh, Luke chapter number six. But while you're turning there, I want you to think about Job just for a minute. You know, Job lost everything. Imagine in one day, he lost his children. He lost his Everything he had, his money, his children, everything. And all of a sudden, his three friends show up and they said, what have you done? What kind of sin have you committed? What, what happened in your life that made God do this to you? Did you know that God trusted Job enough to allow hardship to come into his life? But his friends done him wrong when they said, you've done something wrong, Job. So somebody tell me, Philip, I know you know this. What did God give Job after his trial? He gave him back everything double. He gave him back everything double. But I want you to listen to something right here. Now think about these, these three men and Job's wife that, that done him wrong. Job chapter 42 in verse number 10, I'll read it to you. And the Lord turned the captivity of Job. That means he turned it around. When Job prayed for his friends. But not until he prayed for his friends. Also the Lord gave Job twice as much as he had before. And verse number 12 says, So the Lord blessed the latter end of Job more than his beginning. For he had 14,000 sheep and 6,000 camels and 1,000 yoke of oxen. Seven sons and three daughters. But the key to that entire verse. These people done Job wrong. And God turned it around in his life when he prayed for the ones that done him wrong. Sure. And in your life, what do you have to do to the person for the person that done you wrong? You have got to pray for him. All right.
It is. I know. I know it would have to be. The really hard part is when you when it says to pray for somebody, it's tempting to ask God that they get that the, that that person gets what they deserve, especially if they've done something that's actually against the law or something like that to you. But I have to fight that urge every time I think of this person. That's right. Yeah, that's right. That's right. All right, we're in Luke chapter 6. I want you to look at verse 35. We'll finish up right here. It says, But love your enemies, and do good, and lend, hoping for nothing again. And your reward shall be great. And ye shall be, here's what I want in my life, And ye shall be the children of the highest, for he is kind to the unthankful and to the evil. But now, let's look at this in the way that it really is in life. Now, I give you the list of ten things. But did you know at one time, I was an enemy of God. I was unthankful. I was evil. I was full of hate. I was a user. I was full of sin. Why? Because I was born with it. Yeah. I told you I got saved as a kid. But I was born with sin in my heart. I had a desire to sin when I was born. It came from my father, and it came from his father, and it's passed down through our blood. I'm no better than the ones that have done me wrong. Yeah. And how did God treat me when I was all these things? I was his enemy. I was unthankful. I was an evil, full of hate. I was a user. But God treated me. Verse 27, he loved me. Amen. He done good to me. Verse 28, he blessed me. Verse 30, he gave to me. Verse 34, he lended to me knowing that I couldn't repay. Verse 36, he was merciful to me. Verse 37, he forgave me through the blood of his son, and now he chooses not to judge or condemn me because he redeemed me and he justified me. I did none of that. I was the evil one in the relationship. And he promises, look at verse 38, that if I extend these things to others, that he will give these things to me, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. And he's a man of his word. Amen. What we give, we're going to receive. That's what the word says here. When we give unforgiveness, that's exactly what we're going to get. But when we forgive, God has a desire to give us even more forgiveness. Amen? Amen. Good. Philip, you pray for us. Lord God, we thank you for this lesson. We really need it, Lord God. I pray you help us take it to heart. We pray, Luke, the rest of the service will save any here that are in our church. Love you, praise you.